martial artist, author, survivalist, Stefan Verstappen, How to Build Communities. Back with more in Hour 2 right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. Thanks for inviting me into your home, your long-haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well-appointed basement with the simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. And once again, I'm coming to you from Kalamata in southern Greece. This program was recorded earlier today. This hour, we're going to talk about how to build a community in times of crisis, in times such as these that we're living through right now. We need to learn to rely less on the government and more on ourselves and our neighbors. Stefan Verstappen is the author of The Complete Guide to Building Communities. The book will be released this month, October the 25th, so next week, actually. To, uh, formingcommunities.com is the website, formingcommunities.com. Stefan, welcome back to The Conspiracy Show. It's been a while. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, uh, Richard. It's great to be back. It's been uh, about two years since we last spoke, and I've missed you. Well, likewise. We had just entered into COVID, I believe, last we spoke, and uh, you began writing this crowdfunded book, The Complete Guide to Building Communities, where are we at in terms of, I mean, you, you made some pretty dire predictions in that book, what was going to happen to society and how COVID was going to be used to, to, to push this, this agenda uh, and, and the dire need for people to stand up, take notice, and start building communities in order to survive what's coming. Where are we at now, uh, 18, 19, 20 months later, in terms of this agenda and, and, and what you predicted? Well, where we are is, um, <clears throat> you know, all those uh, grim conspiracy theories we were accused of voicing two years ago have all come true. We predicted all of this stuff. Everybody, pred and anybody that understands how government works and power works and has an understanding of history knew that this is where it was going to go and that it's never going to get better. Governments never relinquish power so once they had the power to control every small detail and facet of your life and 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 the power to track your every movement and now we see in there in the states the power to monitor every financial exchange do you think they're going to let go of that power of course not that's what they do they they you know the the people that run this world richard i i know you know this are psychopaths and psychopaths want control. They just, uh, um, that's all they dream about. It's its not even about money. Everybody says, oh, this cooties and uh, the Kool-Aid, which is my code words for cooties, is a certain disease that I'm not allowed to speak because if you talk about it, you're immediately demonetized and banned from every social media. So instead of calling it the, uh, what it really is. I just call it the cooties. That was a term we had when we were kids. Oh, you got the cooties. No, you do. And the uh, Kool-Aid is their injectable medicine that they are forcing on everybody in the world. They're forcing it on people. Everybody must drink the Kool-Aid. And the reason I use the term, the code word, Kool-Aid, is because that's what the people were forced to drink in uh, Jonestown under the Reverend J Jim Jones, who took his followers to Honduras. And when things started to get ugly, he had them all commit suicide by drinking arsenic mixed with Kool-Aid. And that's exactly what our governments are doing to us now. They came up with the phony cooties, and now they're forcing everybody to drink the Kool-Aid, which is, in effect, a form of poison. And the, 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 the purpose of this is the same. It's to kill a lot of people. I know this is, sounds very radical. It sounds extreme. And uh, a lot of people don't want to believe that, you know, your own government wouldn't do this to us. But I beg to differ. There is a term. It's called democide. And democide means death by your own government, or more correctly, 
genocide by your own government. And if people think that your own government isn't out to murder you, to genocide you, then take a look at the 20th century, where the victims of democide are estimated to be anywhere between 250 million to 350 million. These are the number of people, hundreds of millions of people that were killed by their own governments. So don't think that it can't happen here because we're more civilized. Uh, the people that they killed back in the, in, in the 1900s and on up, they were very civilized people. I would say in some cases even more civilized than we are today. And they killed them. So this is what we're what we're facing. So we are heading towards a collapse of Western civilization. Now, I, in the book, The Complete Guide to Forming Communities, which is the one you referred to earlier, uh, that's the working title, and it should be out by the 25th of this month. I'm still working on it. I'm up to 450 pages so far. I still have more work to do on it. But it's you know 95% complete, so I think I can... You know, burn the midnight oil and get this thing finally finished because I've been working on it for two years. It's been a bigger, bigger project and a bigger headache than I ever imagined it would be. And the reason for that is because I wanted to include everything that people would need to know to form their own communities. You know, all the, the legal aspects and then the psychological aspects, the group dynamics how to start it, how to run it, how to register it, how to incorporate it, and um, how to hide it from the government. So, it, it, you know, it just kept ballooning, 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 and I'm up to 450 pages now. But that will be out at the, uh, you know, close towards the end of this month. In the meantime, I created an online course, an educational course, through the University of Reason, or the other term is autonomy, which is an organization founded and run by Richard Grove, who is also the founder of the Tragedy and Hope website. And they approached me, oh, it was last Christmas they approached me, said, listen, you really need to do a course on this subject material because we agree that the way we are going to survive the collapse of West." civilization is by forming autonomous self-reliant communities and so I hummed and hawed for four months anyway six months <laughs> anyways I finally completed the course and it's up and it's available if you go to my website uh, I have a new website now too it's called forming communities.com and if you go there you can find the course and uh, I'm going to put up a countdown meter on there when the book will be released so you can purchase the book. Anyways. Formingcommunities.com. And the book is The Complete Guide to Forming Communities. Stefan Verstappen, my guest. It's interesting that uh, we are already seeing the construction or the formation of a parallel society as uh, the uh, Western civilization is being divided into the experimental group and the control group. Uh, I think y you and I are, I'm assuming, are both in the control group. <laughs> We're going to avoid the uh, the V <laughs> word here. Um, yes. So those in the control group are now r realizing that they have to, to, to build a parallel society if they want to function. And so we have... Homeschooling, uh, this is something I talk about on my, my daily afternoon show on Saga 960. We talk about homeschooling um, once a week on the, on the program, and uh, it's generating a lot of interest. Uh, we, have, we have parents now who are forming alternative athletic associations for their children because they can't play baseball, soccer, uh, uh, basketball in, in minor leagues, even though... It's not been mandated by the provincial government. These leagues, I don't know what this is all about, but they're taking it on themselves to, to enforce <laughs> mandates for 11-year-olds to 18-year-olds. Uh, to so we're already starting to see this 
uh, in, I guess, in, in, in a small way. Um, but obviously, you know, athletic leagues and, um, and homeschooling, those are only two small aspects of, of a, you know, society or civilization. You also talk about forming communities, uh, something called a, a food co-op. I find this fascinating. Now, we don't have to have a... V Sorry, I said it. We don't have to have uh, documentation to, to shop in a grocery store yet, but that could come. Talk to me about forming a food co-op. Well, a food co-op is one of 17 different types of mutual aid communities. And mutual aid, I, I just mean that people work together for a common goal and for common benefit. And my book also covers homeschooling, how to set it up, how to run it, how to fund it, uh, how to operate it. Because, um, you know, I personally believe that the public education system is a disaster. Um, they don't teach children anything of value anymore. And um, so, you know, I think sending your children to public school is child abuse. I mean, you're, how many more videos do we have to see? of teachers promoting communism. Uh, just recently, we had all those videos of angry parents confronting the school boards because they had stocked their libraries. The libraries that are meant for 12 to 15-year-old kids, they've stocked them with pornography illustrated. I saw the illustrations. Absolutely disgusting. There's, there, what, what, why would a school stock pornography books, but not just pornography, pedophilia? pornography because the books talk about young boys having sex with older men. I mean, this is absolutely madness. And it was only by accident that the parents found out about this and, and they protested. And what was the reaction? What was the reaction of the school board and the government in, in, in America? They labeled those parents domestic terrorists. So there you go. That's why you got to get your kids out of the school. Now, how, how do you do that? Um, you know, most uh, families don't ha make enough money for the mother to stay at home all day educating their children. Usually uh, in, the, in our society now, because of hyperinflation and, and the cost of living, you need two people bringing in an income just to afford a home and a car. So the solution is uh, – that's my poos cat. Uh, Buffy! <laughs> that's all right and she's very sorry about that no she's old i love blind. it i love it and then she wanders around and she doesn't know where she is so she calls out and i have to tell her where i am you know so listen we need to uh, find a way to get our kids educated away from the government the government is poison everything it touches turns to crap that's what governments do and well um forming a homeschooling co-op is one of your best solutions. You just need to get together with two, three, five, ten families, and you can start your own co-op, and you can share the burden of educating your children. Um, as you know, Richard, because we've talked about this, so that will be in the book. Um, the just, same thing with... Sorry, just on that on. note, Stefan, I just wanted to point out that now homeschooling has never been easier because... Uh, we've already been experimenting with, uh, you know, virtual learning when the schools were closed down. So parents are now starting to get used to the idea of their children at home. Now, you don't want to just replace going to public school with, you know, sitting in front of a, a computer. But it's never been easier because now we have many, many teachers who are suddenly looking for work because, again, they've, they're unwilling to be coerced into taking the Kool-Aid, as you say. So they remain in the control group. They're now looking for work. Now, uh, prospective homeschooling parents can reach out to this pool of unemployed teachers and bring them into the homeschooling co-op system. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And um, there's so many options. And, and even something like the, uh, you know, you I'm sure you're familiar with the, the forest schools that they operate in Germany. Yes. Kindergarten. They send the kids out into the woods to get yeah. dirty and climb trees and walk through the water. Yeah. I know. I know. That, I, I love that idea. I think it's brilliant. 
So we have lots of options now. Like you said, you can do some of it online, but again, we've got a lot of teachers that don't want to take the Kool-Aid, and so they have uh, quit the profession, and um, you know, you bring them into the co-op. This, we're, we're, we're paying fees anyways. Like, look at, look at what it costs you to t send a kid to Montessori. And by the way, Montessori started out as a homeschooling co-op. And uh, um, the thing they did differently was that they provided a really good education. And now 100 years later, because they, they started that back in the 1900s sometime, 100 years later, it is the gold standard of education for K to 12. And uh, people are dying to get into Montessori schools and they pay a lot of money to send their kids there. But we can recreate that ourselves for a fraction of the cost of sending your kid to Montessori. Mm -hmm. And that money can also hire good teachers. And um, you have so many options available. So, you know, yeah, you got to get them out of that public school system. And what you're talking about, uh, athletic clubs, again, that's in the book as well. Athletic clubs, how to form them, how to run them, how to operate them. Because part of, <clears throat> part of what we're going to need to do is recreate our own medical system as well. Um, as we can see now and here in Canada, our medical system is destroyed. Um, I, I listen to people from all over the world. I like uh, Vernon Cole, the doctor there in, uh, in England, and he talks about how their hospital, their uh, NHS system has been absolutely destroyed on purpose with the, with the new regulations and and the incompetence and, and the expenses. And so when the civilization collapses and we are in the middle of the collapse, that's why um, you can't go to a hospital. That's why you can't get a doctor. That's why you can't uh, go to a walk-in clinic anymore because it, it's, it's booked. It's full. They're not operating. You need, a, 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 you need to take the Kool-Aid before you can even step in the door. So part of what we need to do during the collapse is recreate our own medical system. And that's going to be in the book. First off, there's ways of funding your own health insurance. And again, it's done through a co-op. So a co-op for those people that don't know exactly what it is, it's, it's a little bit complicated to write it all up and to register it, but it's a form of incorporation and therefore it protects all the members the same as you would be protected if you were a shareholder and a for-profit corporation. Co-ops can or cannot be non-profit. It depends on the people that start it up and run it, how they want to do it. Do they, you know, is there going to be a little bit of extra profit from their activities at the end of the month? And do they want to shovel that back to the members in form of a dividend? Or do they want to reinvest it into the company and continue to run it as a nonprofit? Up to you. But I explain all the benefits and disadvantages of either of those uh, legal functions. But a co-op is interesting in that every member of the co-op is a customer. So that's why you belong to a co-op, because you're a customer. It's basically a glorified buying group. And a buying group is in the book as well. And a buying group is simply something whereby you and a few other people pool your money so that you can get a discount on something you all want. So uh, a, a, a co-op, therefore, allows everybody to be a member and partake of the goods or services that that co-op will provide. Well, how does that work in a public health in a, in a public health uh, system where we have one healthcare provider, the government, and we have one healthcare payer, which is also the government. How, do, how does a, a, a medical co-op work? Do you hire a, a surgeon? Do you hire a specialist? Well, you can do that, but more immediate is you can buy a, a group insurance policy. You can get extra health insurance. And um, what happens is that all the members of the co-op are therefore buyers of a health insurance policy. So it's like a company group uh, a policy. And here in Canada, I, I'm not 100% clear. I'm, you know, my market is basically towards Americans because I find Canadians, oh, don't get me started on Canadians, <laughs> Richard, I find them really lacking in, in courage and in, in initiative. But um, 
for example, I, I know this story with Stefan Molyneux. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, when he was diagnosed with cancer and he tried to get treatment here in Canada and he couldn't, so he went to the United States and he had to pay for, for uh, um, medical uh, treatment in the U.S. Now, if we were to do the same thing, if we were to buy you know, a group insurance policy at a discount through a, and it's called a health insurance co-op, through a co-op, then you can get you know, they, they, they changed the rules, but you used to be able to get private health care here in Canada. But if you need to go over the border into the United States to get private health care or you need to go to Mexico to get private health care, then well, that's what you're going to have to do because you can't get it here anyways. Because they screwed it up. They've destroyed it. They have sabotaged it. And it's all done on purpose. They don't want you to get healthy because, again, the purpose of the government is mass genocide. And they're going to accomplish this through a number of different means, one of which is the Kool-Aid. All right, I've got to jump but in here, uh, Stefan. We've got to jump in and uh, take a time out, yeah. come back. Yeah, I thought so. Stefan Verstappen is my guest, and the website yeah. is formingcommunities.com, formingcommunities.com. Back with more of our conversation right after these. Martial artist, author, survivalist, Stefan Verstappen is here. Formingcommunities.com, the website, and the book, The Complete Guide to Forming Communities. So we were talking about co-ops. Talk to me about a food co-op and how that would work. We're seeing, you know, in inflation just getting ready to take off like a rocket ship on rails. Now more than ever, I think we need to pool resources in order to secure our food supply. Exactly. So a food co-op is, again, it's a co-op, so you're, you're incorporating, and the members of the co-op are um, shareholders in that incorporation. What I like about the incorporation is that everybody gets exactly one vote. So it's not like somebody that, you know, whoever started the co-op suddenly becomes the president and they're the boss and they can issue executive orders to all the other members. You know, that doesn't happen. This is a, a pure democratic uh, organization. Everybody has one vote and um, they can elect a board of directors to run things, but it doesn't mean that the board of directors are the bosses by any means. So a food co-op is, again, it's similar to a buying group and you can do this as a buying group too. You don't have to incorporate as a co-op. It's up to the people for themselves who are forming these communities, what kind of legal structure you think would work best for you. A co-op is good for a number of reasons. One, you can buy and sell property as, a, as an incorporated entity. You can also open bank accounts in the name of the co-op. So this makes it a little bit easier to handle the finances. You can do this as an unincorporated community as well. You just get together with 10 people, five people, 15, and you agree to pitch in so much money every month to buy what you need at a discount. And um, so the money is just gonna be cash or debit or whatever, and you're just gonna have to keep track of it yourself. But if you're looking for funding from the government, or if you're looking to um, get donations from the public at large, um, then you're better off to get a, a bank account where all of this goes through. Now, a food co-op, is uh, basically a buying group whereby again you pool your resources and you buy the food at a discount direct sometimes direct from the producers from the farmers and uh, sometimes direct from the wholesalers and then you there's two ways to do this you can either just distribute it distribute the food that you've bought and this is i forget what they call it i think they call it a box uh, a box system where you know you put the food in equal amounts in in the box and all the members come by and pick up a box of food so if it's produce you bought the produce directly from the farmers you know whatever it is that they had the green beans the tomatoes the squash and you know you you, you dole it out for whatever you spent for it and into the boxes and then every member comes by and picks up their box of fresh produce every week but you can also, if you're a, a food co-op, if you're incorporated, you can get the equivalent of a retailer's or a wholesaler's license, and you can buy some of your stuff directly from the wholesalers. Either way, you're going to be saving 
minimum 20% on your grocery bills and up to 50% of your grocery bills. And in, like you said, now with the hyperinflation and, and uh, it's becoming ever more difficult to get decent food and to buy enough for your family, having a 20 to 50% discount will go a long way to feeding your family. And so those are the benefits of forming a food co-op. Uh, the, the larger the co-op, the larger the savings potentially? Absolutely, because it's like everything else. You know, uh, I walk into a store, I say, listen, I got 100 bucks to spend. And I do this sometimes, you know, I'll pay you cash, don't, don't charge me tax. Oh, 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 don't, don't let the government hear me say that. I, I use that approach with everybody. You know, if, all they can do is say, no, no, we have to put it on the books. I said, okay. But obviously, if I go to somebody and say, I got 100 bucks to spend, they go, yeah, well, I don't know. I, I can't give you a discount for 100 bucks. I said, I got $1,000 to spend. Well, I can spend it with you or I can go down the street to the other guy. Can you give me a discount for a $1,000 purchase? Guaranteed they're going to give you a discount. And if you go to them and you say, listen, I got $5,000 to spend. I'm representing 25 families. We're all going to buy these groceries and uh, we put their money together. So this month we're going to spend $5,000 for the groceries and uh, for all the members of the community. What kind of discount can you give me? And that's how you approach it. It's it's a great idea. Um, what about fuel? We're looking at natural ga gas prices, home heating fuel going through the roof, and we're also due for a very harsh winter, we're being told. You put those two together, a lot of people are going to be choosing between putting food on the table and keeping their house at a comfortable temperature. Can the co-op system work for purchasing home heating fuel? Absolutely. Um, and again, it's going to be... It's in my book. I've already written a chapter on that. And I include a case study from England uh, whereby a group of people, they all lived on the same street. They all uh, have to buy uh, heating fuel, fuel oil for to heat their homes. And previously, they all just, you know, filled up their tanks individually and paid the, the premium rate for that. But they formed a buying group now they didn't incorporate as a co-op it's not always necessary to incorporate as a co-op sometimes if it's going to be the if it's if you want to buy the same thing every couple of months then you don't need to go through all the business of incorporating and writing a charter and bylaws and registering it with the government you simply have an agreement between you and your neighbors and you can write that agreement out in a in a one-page uh, mutual aid agreement whereby it says, you know, we, the undersigned, uh, dedicate, uh, you know, to buy our home heating fuel together with the rest of the community. So then what they did was they, they bought a truck, you know, because, of, you know, they bought the whole container truck full of fuel at one time and had them go up and down the street and fill up everybody's tank. And they were able to get like a 25% discount on their home heating fuel. So you can stay in your home, buy your home heating fuel by yourself. Your neighbor does it too, and your neighbor down the street does it too. Everybody's paying premium prices to get their, you know, their, uh, uh, their tank filled up individually. But you just buy the whole truck full. You buy the whole, cont uh, the whole tanker full of oil, and you have them go up and down and fill up everybody's uh, uh, fuel. And if you buy the whole tanker truck at one time, well, you get a 25% discount. Okay, that's fine if you're getting, if you're heating your home with petrol. What if it's natural gas that comes through the street, under the street? What do you do then? No, well, then you're screwed. There's no way to get a discount on natural gas. So maybe think about switching back to, uh, to petrol. Well, it's heating oil. Right? It's not petrol. Heating oil, sorry. Heating oil, yes. Or you can go propane and you can do the same thing with propane. Like, like instead of uh, everybody everybody buying, you know, um, a 50-pound tank, uh, well, you buy 150-pound tanks. You get the discount on that and distribute it, those tanks. But unfortunately, Richard, I can't think of a way of uh, getting a discount on the natural gas because it's pumped in. When I uh, talk to people and you know i do consultations for people that need to get up to speed on their preps on you know and their plans how to survive what's coming i recommend and especially here in canada that you have at least two or three waves 
to heat your home because if the power goes out, and I say if, but I mean when the power goes out, your natural gas isn't going to function anyways. You need you need electricity to start up the uh, to spark up the uh, furnace. And uh, they could cut off the natural gas as well. So you better have two other methods of heating your home. And the two two other possible methods of heating your home is uh, a wooden fireplace. And uh, and again, in that case, you can, again, work together with your neighbors and buy, you know, cords of wood in bulk from a supplier. And again, negotiate for a discount. The other way to do it is to have propane heaters. You can also have propane electrical generators for when the power goes out. So propane is great for running both heaters and generators. And again, you can probably buy, if you work together as a community, discounted propane cylinders. And then the third option is kerosene. I have a kerosene heater right here in the the closet in case of an emergency and the emergency is the power goes out the heating goes out the electrical power uh, electrical baseboard heaters don't work but i got the kerosene heater and kerosene is still uh, fairly inexpensive and again if you wanted to work together with you know five or ten families you could buy kerosene in bulk at a discount now you can also get electrical generators that would work on kerosene so i'm planning for Basically, the book is how to survive when the civilization collapses and you have to do all this for yourself. You have to supply your own food or source it or buy it. You have to find ways of sourcing your own medical care. We talked about insurance, but what you said earlier is also very possible, and that is we fund our own hospitals. All right, we I fund our jump, own clinics. I've got to jump in. We'll pick up on that when we come back. Stefan Verstappen, yeah. the uh, complete guide to forming communities, formingcommunities.com. Back with more in a minute. My name is Richard Serrett. Stay with us. Stefan Verstappen stays with us, the complete guide to forming communities. Go to formingcommunities.com to order the book. There is also a course available at formingcommunities.com. We've been talking about forming co-ops in order to buy in bulk, reduced prices, buying wholesale, and so forth. Further to our earlier discussion on health care and the collapse of public health care, you talk about funding our own hospitals. How would that work? Well, this is what our great-great-grandparents did. They formed, and this is before the Rockefeller American Medical Association allopathic poison control system was initiated. And before we had public health care, before we had OHIP, before we had the Canadian government supposedly funding our health care, before there was uh, um, Obamacare, before there was... uh, um, well, what's that other one that the you know the emergency health care they have there in the states before any of that happened this is the age of our own grandparents and if you're a bit younger than me then be your grand great grandparents what they did was they formed mutual aid societies also called friendly societies or fraternal societies and these were basically a co-op it was not incorporated as a corp, but that's how they operated. And uh, you may have heard um, some of the names of the old fraternal societies, like the Moose Lodge or the Elk Lodge or the Foresters, <clears throat> even uh, groups such as the Rotarians and the Lions Clubs. These were all mutual aid societies. And the primary p- purpose of all these societies was to provide medical care for their members and what they did was they charged their members the equivalent of one day's pay per month and for that one day's pay per month all of their medical costs were covered their dental costs were covered and it became so successful you see we pay so much money to the government in taxes and they're supposed to provide that for us but governments are corrupt what, you know, for every dollar you spend to the government to pay for health insurance, the government steals and whittles away and diverts 97 cents of that dollar. 
And therefore, you know, we have a crappy medical system because all the money we pay into it has been funneled off and siphoned off and given to the insider cronies, and none of it actually goes to pay for medicine. But when our great-grandparents ran these organizations, there was no $3 million salaries for the CEOs and the organizers. Every penny went to provide for their medical costs. Now, it became, in the beginning, what they did is they would hire one doctor to take care of the medical needs of the entire community. So let's say you had 100 people. That one doctor, his full-time job, whether he treated someone or not, because he wasn't charging by the hour, he got paid every month the same amount of money every month, enough for him to have a happy, healthy life. And all he had to do was take care of those 100 people. Now, here's an interesting thing, is that the incentive for that doctor is to make sure his patients stay healthy because the healthier they were, the less work he had to do. He gets the same money, whether he goes goes to treat somebody or he stays home and plays golf. He gets the same money. Now, the doctor would rather stay home and play golf, so he wants to make sure his constituency, his patients are healthy. Now, contrast that with the modern medical system run by the pharmaceutical companies where a thing like a cure or a treatment is verboten. You know, they they don't want you to get healthy because it's not profitable for them. Their profit incentive is in keeping you sick. And lo and behold, look at all the illness and sickness and suffering and misery and all the expenses for pharmaceutical drugs and prescriptions. And well, because it's profitable. And in the old system where the mutual aid society would hire the doctor, the doctor would perform what we used to call home visits. I remember I was like five years old and I had an ear infection. And back in those days, that's how far back I go, Richard. I'm an old man. But back in those days, the doctor would come to your house. He would have a little black bag. And when I had my ear infection, he would go up to my bedroom I would be laying in bed and he would examine me and uh, treat me and then he would go on his way. That's how med medicine used to work 120 years ago. Stefan, and i got to jump in here again. Uh, here's the other yep. thing. Uh, we're going to take a time out, but just like with teachers, now you have a pool of teacher uh, of doctors and nurses that refuse to be coerced, refuse to take the, the, uh, the Kool-Aid. Maybe they've had their licenses revoked for speaking out. Uh, by the various colleges of physicians and surgeons, uh, so right. they right. are they are available to join your community. Back with more of our conversation on forming your own communities with Stefan Verstappen right after these. Don't go away. Stefan Verstappen stays with us. Formingcommunities.com, and the book is. The Complete Guide to Forming Communities. So we were talking about uh, mutual aid societies and, and how our ancestors basically built hospitals and provided medical care for the people in their communities where you would hire your own doctor. Uh, you wanted to finish off with that before we move on. Sure. So they started off by, that's how they began. So you, you, get, you get 100 people together, they put in a day's worth of wages every month, and uh, you hire your own doctor. And in those days, the doctors would just come to your house. Maybe see, you've seen some of those old black and white movies, you know, where they say, oh, call the doctor. And then the doctor rushes <laughs> to the person's home. Um, I know this is unheard of in modern society now, but that's how it used to be. But they started off like that. But because it's so effective and efficient to crowd fund your own medical care, that within a year, they started building their own walk-in clinics. And within three years, they started building their own hospitals. I mean, these are people that built their own hospitals by donating 
or uh, paying into their community, at, you know, the equivalent of a hundred bucks a month. What what do you pay for health insurance in the United States? You know, three thousand dollars a month. These people did it for a hundred dollars a month. They built their own hospitals that was open exclusively to their members. But it didn't stop there because of the efficiency of you know, pooling your money and because of the efficiency of not having the government in there stealing 95, 97% of every penny you've pooled, not only did they build their own hospitals, they built retirement homes. They built in, uh, intensive uh, um, uh, 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 assisted care homes. And it didn't even stop there. They went on, but they had so much money left over because it's effective when you handle the money yourself, you spend it on what you need and you don't spend it on corruption, that they had excess of money so that they could now create their own scholarships for for the students of their members. And they even went as far, the good fellows there in Wisconsin, they bought property and built a park with picnic gardens and a bandstand and they held dances and concerts and you know it was just amazing what you can do when you work together as a community and pool your money so that's what our great grandparents did can we not do that of course we can it's not that complicated but you have to work together and you work together and you can accomplish that so in the beginning work together hire a doctor even if you hire a doctor to come and uh, uh, open up, you know, a, a space at the local library and see, you know, once a week, he'll see, you know, 10, 20 people from your community, make sure you're okay. You can start off that way. You're getting medical care. And if you need blood uh, um, tests and you need MRIs and x-rays, well, you can always book that through a hospital or through another clinic anyways. But from there, they went to building their own hospitals and we can do the same and not only can we do the same we need to do the same because the medical system is an abomination it's been taken over by the rockefeller allopathic doctors that only know how to poison and cut and nobody gets cured in that system whereas you have doctors whose best interest is to cure you the more of their patients they can cure and treat, the more money they make and the less they have to work. So it's the incentive is there. All right, so let's let's say that you want to form a community and you have, uh, let's say you start off small, a dozen families and their members, and you may have a community of 100 people, which, you know, that could be a, a small village. Uh, although you're Absolutely. scattered, you might be scattered over across, the, you know, the Halton region and... Uh, Peel region and and Markham Stouffville um, region. How do you keep the community together? How do you how do you administrate it? All right. So this is the big problem, uh, Richard. First of all, I want people to understand what it is we're trying to do. The ship of state, our current society, is the Titanic. We've hit the iceberg. We're taking on water. The stern is already. 45 degrees out of the water, we're going down. If you stay on the ship, you will die. And by the ship, I mean everything that the government used to do. Unemployment insurance, welfare, uh, food stamps, health health care, and even law enforcement. All of that is going to go away. And we need to head for the lifeboats. Now, I want you to think of forming a community as a lifeboat and that lifeboat will keep you safe and keep you alive while the ship sinks that's why we need to do this and we need to do it right away now like with any lifeboat you're gonna to have to make sure that you have the right number of people in the lifeboat for example um, you know you're almost to capacity in your lifeboat and now we have you know, a 450 pound purple haired social justice warrior. Are you going to let her on the, on the on the boat? She's going to sink the boat. You can if you don't let her on, you probably have room for two or three other people that would provide that would pull their fair share and, and uh, be an asset to the community. Then you can let them on. But if you let in just one psychopath, just one lunatic, just one selfish 
son of a gun, <clears throat> they will destroy your community. So part of the process and part of the big problem with this is you need to screen your members. Now, I recommend there are different ways to screen them. One of the things I recommend that you you use to screen them is that they need to have a prerequisite in order to join your community. For example, in the book, I talk about another form of community, which were artists' communities. Um, this was a big thing back in the 1850s, 1860s, you know, um, you know, with uh, Walt Whitman and um, his poetry has inspired a lot of the artists in those days to move to the country. Now, they didn't live on a commune. I'm not talking a commune. Communes don't work. Uh, so forget about buying, you know, 100 acres and we all live together. No, that doesn't work. But what the artists <clears throat> did is they all moved to a similar region, like a town. So they bought houses or rented houses in the same town. Now they worked together, <clears throat> and this is how I recommend we do it as well. And that is, it's a what I call in the book, a decentralized community. Now a centralized community is everybody lives on the same farm and we all grow and, and live happily ever after, except that never happens. But a decentralized community is, and I recommend that everybody lives within 20 miles of each other. 20 miles because that's how far the average person can walk in one day. If there's an emergency and you got to get to somebody's house to get fed and, and get some medical care or whatever, at least you can walk to your next <laughs> member's house. And that's what the artists did. They worked together. But what they did is they pooled, again, using like a co-op system or a buying group. They pooled their money to buy their groceries, which they distributed to all the artists. They pooled their money to rent a gallery space where they could all exhibit their artworks. They pooled their money to get their medical care. So something like an artist community was actually very effective. But... To get into the artist community, you had to submit a portfolio of your work, meaning, you know, you had all your sketches and your paintings and your sculptures and everything that you've done. And then that portfolio would go to sort of like a membership board or an admissions board. And they would take a look at your art and see if you qualify as a professional artist. If you didn't, you didn't get into the community. We need to do something like that when we form our own communities. We need to see the person's background. What are your skills? And I, I have a number of ways of doing that. I have like a an admission form that people would fill out, which would say like, you know, I would say I'm, I'm really good at growing a garden. I'm not so good at first aid, but I'm good at uh, wilderness herbs, but I'm good at building. I'm good at fixing. I'm mm -hmm. good at building uh, um alternative forms of energy, solar panels or windmills. And they would go through the list of all the possible skills and attributes that they could contribute to the community. And you would have members fill that out. And that's all in the and, book, the, the, these admission forms and, and so forth, yes. all in the book. Okay, we just we got, about, it's we, we got about 30 seconds here. That's why it's taking me so long. Anyways, we need to screen these people out. And there's different ways that we can do that. And it's all in the book. Fantastic. All right. People take note. Get ready. Prepare your lifeboat. Stefan Verstappen, uh, the book again is The Complete Guide to Forming Communities, formingcommunities.com, the website. Thank you again, my friend. Be safe. Be well. All the best. Thank you, Richard. All right. That's it for me. Just a reminder, Don Jeffries will be our guest host next week. The week following, Ali Siadatan with Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Should be a great couple of shows. Until then, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home.